Hi, everybody. My name is Kristen Looney. I'm an assistant professor at Georgetown University. Um, this panel, the 1115 to 1230 panel, is about contentious elite politics. Um, I have been instructed to keep strict time, but fortunately, it looks like we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A um, in this session, and also to keep the bio short, since I think most of you have um, copies of uh, who these speakers are. I'll just do very brief introductions and then turn it over to them. Um, so to my right, we have Christopher Johnson. He holds the Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS. Um, he spent nearly two decades in the US government working in various agencies. He was a senior senior China analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, he is a graduate of UCSD and has a master's in security studies from George Washington University. So he has a long history in DC. Um, and then we have Richard McGregor, an accomplished journalist who um, uh, served as Washington bureau chief for the Financial Times, um, leading the newspaper's coverage of American politics and managing its DC-based team of reporters from 2011 to 2014. He is author of the book, The Party, The Secret World of China's Communist Rulers, which was described by the Econom Economist as a masterful depiction of the Chinese political system. Since February of last year, he has been a public policy fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, Mr. McGregor is originally from Australia and graduated from Sydney University. Um, and then finally, last but not least, we have Professor David Shambaugh, um, a faculty member at George Washington University, a very accomplished scholar on contemporary China and international relations of Asia. Um, he has many accomplishments. Among them, he has published more than 30 books and over 300 articles. Um, he is a free frequent contributor to the international media, serves on a number of editorial boards, um, and is truly uh, a very, very leading, one of the leading experts in the field of Chinese politics. So it's a pleasure to have all three of these speakers here today, and I look forward to hearing, hearing um, their comments and your, your reactions. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Great. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Kristen. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, try to keep my remarks focused. Uh, I think I'll sort of have my uh, remarks focus on the notion of how contentious are the elite politics. I found it interesting that uh, in, the, uh, in the arranging of this panel, that was the term that was used. So there seems to be a built-in assessment uh, that they are indeed contentious or extremely contentious, which is something that I think has been a running theme, especially in the last couple of weeks. I think it was last Tuesday we had front page articles in the Washington Post and in the New York Times discussing uh, with, with bold headlines about Xi Jinping losing his grip on power and so on, and articles that didn't deliver on those titles, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, and so just to give a sense of, of uh, you know, how contentious are these politics and how does that impact uh, foreign policy? Uh, my own sense is obviously, you know, there's a lot of pushback going on inside the system right now uh, to what the agenda that Xi Jinping is pushing. Um, but I think what's very important is to look at uh, where this resistance is coming from, and most importantly, does it res represent some sort of serious uh, elite-level conflict among the top leaders over Xi Jinping's agenda, or are these uh, resistance voices mainly from, from elsewhere? And I think when we analyze the most recent uh, sort of pieces of evidence that, uh, that this is happening, these letters, for example, one calling for Xi Jinping to step down from office, um, a very interesting article which to me has more significance uh, found on the website of the Central Discipline Inspection Commission, talking about you know sort of uh, why the, the leader's willingness to receive wise counsel. There's obviously some sort of tremors, but the sense that I get is that Xi Jinping remains very much uh, in charge of the system that he has created. Uh, that he is still in a position where he is not simply first among equals uh, within the leadership, but simply just first. Um, and is continuing to press forward an agenda uh, based on that uh, set of circumstances. And how is he able to, to do that? I think uh, several basic foundational points. Uh, the first is that um, coming into power, Xi Jinping was able to take advantage of uh, what you might call this sort of born to rule uh, um, personality and, and sense of entitlement that he has from his status as one of these princelings, the children of the uh, founders of the regime. 
And as such, that gave him a built-in political and other network uh, that he was able to activate from the moment he arrived on the scene, uh, in sharp contrast to his two predecessors, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, who started very much at a deficit in terms of um, their positions in that regard. She came in fully empowered with all three of the major titles, um, and again, especially in the military, had a strong network of, uh, of supporters that he could rely on to get uh, a sense of how to look at things. Secondly, he has uh, developed this sort of kitchen cabinet style of advisory um, where he has tended to emphasize less the formal uh, mechanisms of decision making and information flow within the system, uh, especially to the detriment of the state council ministries. Uh, it's very clear to me that they're far less influential in terms of policy formulation and in, in some cases even execution than they were under Hu Jintao. And it's all sort of drifted over to either the party through its sort of formal entities, including a couple of these new leading groups that have been set up during Hu Jinta, uh, excuse me, Xi Jinping's tenure, uh, most obviously the National Security Commission on the uh, security, uh, military, and foreign affairs side, and the uh, comprehensively deepening reform leading group on the economic uh, side. And a lot more emphasis in economic policy also on the party's financial and economic leading group, which in the past was a much smaller entity, now has nearly tri tripled in size in terms of uh, its staff in the last three years. Um, and as most recently evidenced by the drafting of the 13th uh, five-year plan, uh, is playing a much more direct role in actual policy formulation and, and implementation. And then uh, in e an even less formal uh, layer of these advisors, uh, people like Liu He, people like Fang Xinghai on the economic side, they have their, uh, they have their counterparts on the security side, um, who are giving him sort of day-to-day -day advice. Um, so a very small universe of people um, who actually know what's going on. And I think that makes all of our jobs as external analysts uh, extremely challenging. Um, and I worry that in a lot of the commentary of late, uh, there's a desire far too quickly in my assessment to take small incidents and blow them up into signs of, of some sort of deep elite conflict um, within the system. Um, but we will see. I mean, you know, it's very clear that Xi Jinping this year has decided that now is the time to begin to focus on the 19th Party Congress next fall. Um, and I would expect he will be devoting 90% of his political energy and capital toward that enterprise. Um, and the sense I get is that if he gets his way next fall, uh, we will see a very disruptive process uh, and that we will see uh, a lot of changes to what we have seen um, in past Congresses with regard to how they deal with things like uh, age requirements for retirement, um, what you might call sort of step-by-step -step elevation of promotions. Um, and even just basic criteria for how cadre are being evaluated and uh, promoted turnover in the Central Committee, I suspect, will be quite massive if he gets his way. Um, so a sort of very uh, disruptive agenda. I would also suspect that he would not uh, signal the succession, as uh, we have seen at the mid-Congress in the last several. So a real departure, I think, from a, a lot of what we've seen in the past. And this will be uh, not, grand, not greeted very warmly uh, by a lot of the people who feel that you know, look, we've had a process, we've had these norms that we've been abiding by, um, and that includes your successor, is sort of technically already settled, and he's making very clear that those arrangements are, are, are being undone. So I think we will continue to see that kind of froth, um, but I see no sign uh, that, uh, that Xi Jinping is really um, struggling to maintain influence at this point. And the second big argument out there that I think you know, sort of speaks to this contentious uh, politics is that he's provoking a crisis with this behavior, right? Uh, whether it's turning back the clock in terms of political, uh, political uh, tightening, um, ideological tightening, media tightening, uh, the anti-corruption campaign, all of these sort of things, he's sort of provoking some sort of crisis. Um, my own assessment is that it's far too early to judge that uh, at this stage. He may indeed be provoking a crisis, but I think it's too early to tell. What I think we can say with absolute certainty is that he managed to suppress an existential crisis uh, to the party in the form of these tigers uh, that were, have been arrested during the anti-corruption campaign, especially in its first few years, uh, whereby I mean Ling Jihua, the, head of, the former head of the general office, Zhou Yongkang, the head of the security services, Xu Tsai Ho and Guo Bo Xiong in the military. I mean, it's important for us, I think, as analysts to remember that uh, you know, when we think of China, sometimes we think of big country, large economy, uh, emerging global power, but at core, there's still a Leninist political system. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a situation where the head of the general office, the nerve center of the party, and oh, by the way, which manages leadership security, um, the person who was in charge of military personnel for eight years building a private army inside the PLA, 
um, the head of the security services, the counterintelligence chief in the security services, all working independently, not together, but independently, but toward the same goal of unsettling Xi Jinping's succession, <laughs> this is a serious challenge. And so I think everything he's done in that regard with the anti-corruption campaign is actually a totally logical response. I think his argument would be, while some commentators are emphasizing that he's destroying institutionalization of the system to the degree that ever existed um, with his approach, I think he would be arguing, I defended institutionalization. Mm -hmm. I was the institutional choice. And this was the, uh, the, the maneuver to, uh, to uh, come against me. And so um, my own sense is uh, we really have to pay attention to the facts, not allow our own predilections about whether we like what Xi Jinping is doing uh, with the system or not to influence uh, our objective analysis of what's actually happening. And so how is this all impacting foreign policy, just real quickly? Um, I think uh, my own sense is that because of this sort of heavy emphasis on the politics and on the economics, I mean, those are really the two things. I mean, my view is in Xi Jinping's day-to-day -day agenda these days, politics certainly trumps economics, and economics trumps foreign policy uh, by far. Uh, the sense that I get is that he set out his course on foreign policy in the uh, Foreign Affairs Work Conference speech that he delivered in the uh, fall of 2014 where he clearly is breaking with uh, Deng Xiaoping's sort of longstanding guidance of keeping a low profile internationally um, and pushing greater activism, some would say assertiveness, um, and uh, you know, basically creating some new rules um, internationally. Uh, and I think, you know, again, some are too quick to judge that China's out to remake the international system. That's not my sense. The view I get is that where they can smoothly integrate into existing organizations, they will want to do so. But where they perceive that that's not happening, take IMF voting uh, share requirements as an example, um, they're going to set up parallel mechanisms that uh, tend to advance their own uh, interests. They're a big country with, uh, with interests, and they're going to protect those interests. And so I think we could, should expect to see more of the same from Xi Jinping, a multi-directional foreign policy, definitely one that's not as focused on the United States. He seems far less uh, solicitous of good relations uh, with the United States than his predecessors. I, I would say it's fair to say that uh, Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin probably spent 80 to 90 percent of their foreign policy bandwidth managing U.S.-China relations, whether those were good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, Xi Jinping has clearly demonstrated that he's not as interested uh, in that. That doesn't mean he doesn't see the U.S.-China relationship as the most important, as we saw on clear display uh, last week with the meeting between Obama and Xi. It's just that he doesn't feel that uh, he needs to be over solicitous of that relationship, and I think that requires both sides to think very seriously uh, about how we manage this relationship going forward. So let me stop there and turn over to Richard. Thank you, Chris. Yes, Richard. Uh, thanks very much. It's always very difficult to follow Chris. Um, I'm actually going to work from notes, unlike him. Um, f first of all, uh, what's the best explanation for, for, you know, why is she she? Why does he behave like he does? Um, I think the conventional explanation that whose personality and consensual style was ineffective, Hu Jintao's uh, uh, personality and style was ineffective and easily taken advantage of, I think that's basically true. Um, uh, Wen Jiabao and Hu Jintao, I think, basically were the ultimate housekeepers, if you like, in terms of uh, policy terms. They bedded down the economic reforms that their predece predecessors had unleashed and they sort of fed off the export an investment boom triggered by the entry into the WTO in 2000. And by and large, the watchword of their style was caution, uh, which of course, as we saw, saw many of their sort of ambitious and calculated underlings build you know, massive sprawling empires uh, in the party, in the military, and in the state-owned companies, particularly in the energy sector. And I think, as Chris referred to, and I'll come back to this, these have really only been confronted in a full-on manner uh, by Xi since coming to power. Um, as to Xi's style, I think he's looked backwards uh, to earlier Chinese eras, to lo eras looking back to Mao and Deng. And I think he's calculated that if he really wanted to get anything done, then what works in China uh, in the CCP system is not a consensual decision-making process, but basically a much more dictatorial one and uh, one held much more tightly with a smaller kitchen cabinet group of people. Um, um, in some respects, such powers or such decision-making process is very, very effective. Uh, in the short term, for example, Xi's anti-corruption campaign um, has been very effective and efficient in targeting and rapidly bringing down corrupt officials. Uh, the same in some respects could be said about his restructuring of the military, both in terms of personnel and the broader reorganization of military zones. Um, people have wondered, uh, you know, early in this process in the first two, three years of the Xi Jinping era, 
you know, where was the backlash of this single-minded corruption clean out and, you know, and how she could get away with uh, cleaning out so many wealthy and powerful clans within the party. Uh, I think on this point I agree with Chris. I think she himself, frankly, was very much the backlash when he came in um, against the machinations of uh, Bo Xilai, Zhou Yong Kang and the like, uh, which you know you can see detailed in the official media these days. There doesn't seem to be too much secret about it. Um, and after all, they were really aiming, if, if not to knock him off as uh, becoming CCP party secretary, they wanted to, at least to nobble him uh, in the job should he have got there. Um, and that's the existential crisis that Chris was referring to. Um, I really think we're in a new period now as far as Xi Jinping goes. Um, and I think that the sort, the sort of style that he does operate with really no longer yields uh, fruits that um, um, it did in the first three years of his uh, rule. Um, in other words, put it another way, Xi might be a very strong leader, but I don't think that means he's necessarily an effective one. Um, he's tough politically, but in policy terms, particularly on the domestic economy, I think we increasingly see um, feet of clay. Um, you know, it's one thing to root out blatantly corrupt officials, but the converse of that is not necessarily true. In other words, the new breed of officials who are taking their place, who are in theory armed with a much sort of clearer and cleaner sense of governance and party discipline, will be any better at their jobs, will have a, you know, a, a more enhanced and creative sense of policy making, and even if they do, will have the ability or power to put their ideas into practice. Um, you saw a number of recent articles, particularly last year, talking about how she has basically subordinated uh, economic reform to party reform and consolidation. But it's certainly not clear to me that party consolidation bodes well for economic reform uh, at all, whatever the sequencing. Um, in fact, party consolidation should have the opposite effect um, if we agree that liberalisation of the Chinese economy is what it needs. Um, you know, the argument in favour of party reform and a cleaner CCP is that it lays down the tracks for substantive and credible economic reform, but it could also, and in fact would most likely, I think, have the opposite effect. Um, the other argument that Xi Jinping, you know, the old Chinese sort of uh, argument that Xi is turning left to turn right, um, I think hardly seems to ring true these days. Uh, four years, I think, you know, we've seen a pretty consist consistent ideology on his part. Um, the same, in some respects, I think applies to the military. She got rid of uh, a lot of senior generals, once considered to be untouchable. He's pushed through a substantial structural reorganisation and, and did that, and in fact had that announced just a month or two, I think, before a Taiwan election, which you know I think otherwise would have been considered a very sensitive time. Um, now, getting or sort of assessing the the fruits of these reforms, I think, is a it's a much longer ter uh, term uh, proposition. But once again, I think there's no guarantee that uh, cleaner generals will be better generals, um, even if they are you know concentrating more on their day jobs um, and not selling commissions under the table most of the time. Um, and nor is it clear on the second and more important point whether the new military structures will work. Um, so in other, other words, in terms of achieving results, I think the restructurings that he's undertake, undertaken, which initially looked really, really tough, certainly Hu Jintao would have never had the ability and probably nor the gumption to do that. Um, at the end of the day, that might end up being the easy part of the equation for Hu Jintao. I mean, no amount of ruthlessness can easily turn around and refit the economy, nor change the global economy within which China has to work, just like every other country. And no amount of banging heads together can really retool policymakers' minds, nor give them greater power within the bureaucracy. Now, let's go back to the other backlash, or the current backlash that Chris referred to. I think it's certainly true that there's more pushback now against C. Um, uh, in terms of his particular, his uh, well, his style and his uh, his ideology, it's a more widespread group of people. Uh, it's not just the rich and powerful families and clans that I referred to earlier that basically have had their lifetimes uh, work pulled, uh, you know, taken away from them overnight. Um, it's also China's small L <clears throat> in inverted commas liberals uh, in the media, in academia. Um, whose hopes that she might be a, a new kind of leader have obviously thoroughly been buried. Um, now, I, I think 
that, you know, when you look at the people arraigned against him, this is hardly a stable coalition. Uh, it's much su more surprising that we haven't seen much more dissent, uh, you know, given the sort of shake-up that he's given to the party, bureaucracy and the like. Um, so in that respect, um, uh, he's, um, I don't think he's under any threat at all. Um, I think where Xi has been most effective and most successful, at least in Chinese terms, is, uh, and where he faces the least dissent is uh, foreign policy. Um, I might say at this point, I mean, that we're obviously going to spend all of this panel talking about Xi Jinping, but there's kind of a bit of a cult of Xi Jinping in DC, which in some respects exaggerates him as an individual. Um, if you look at the sorts of foreign policy uh, um, uh, policies that he's uh, pursuing at the moment, um, I think, you know, you know, when Hu Jintao came into power, China was the eighth largest economy in the world, a much weaker country. There was no guarantee that the entry into the WTO would be uh, as successful as it was. There was no guarantee that the output was going to grow at an average of about 10% for the next decade. Um, and the like. Xi Jinping took over a completely different country. I don't think that the foreign policy aims that he's pursuing are that different. You know, the South China Sea, the, the, the Nine Dash Line or the old Eleven Dash Line, that, that's not new. Uh, the, the issues with Japan and the East China Sea, uh, none of that is new. Certainly Xi Jinping drives consensus. He's, a, he's certainly been much more willing to take risks than uh, Hu Jintao was, but he's also in a much more powerful position with a much more powerful military uh, behind him. And I think uh, as much as one can uh, measure public opinion in China, uh, it, you know, it seems to me, you know, one of the funny things with the South China Sea and the, the, uh, the Nine Dash Line, uh, this is not a scientific statement, obviously, but whenever you talk to Chinese about the Nine Dash Line, it's not even as though this is up for debate. You know, of course it's ours. And you know, once you go outside of China, there's the exact opposite. So in that respect, I feel that you know, Xi Jinping um, has a lot of public support on uh, a more assertive, at least in that place, uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, I think more generally, he's got a quite a in more intelligent mixture of policies on the foreign policy front. Um, you know, hard at the core, flexible at the edges. Um, um, the one belt, one road, I think, in many respects, and we've got to see how that unfolds. Um, you know, it's a creative response to China's strengths and weaknesses. You know, China has too much ca uh, cash and spare cash and overcapacity in its economy. Uh, one belt, one road might help with that. In a geopolitical sense, it allows China, <coughs> China to march west, uh, while its sort of eastern seafront, I think, is a much more unstable environment. Um, on Japan, remember when Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, that was just after the um, issue with the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands. And I think obviously he had to take a tough time at that, at that point. He's since uh, dialed that, deliberately dialed that down. Um, and I obviously don't think he's stepped back from anything and there's still the sort of Chinese patrols around the island. But I think he's sort of put that on the back burner, and I think that has been pretty smart as well. Um, and on the South China Sea, I guess we'll know in 20 or 30 years whether Chinese tactics there have worked. Um, but I think, frankly, uh, the Chinese execution of that <clears throat> um, uh, has really caught the US and regional nations on the hop. Um, uh, the response is obviously being still worked out. I don't know what will be effective there. Um, but um, there is the idea among some that you know China set itself a trap. We'll see. But certainly, I think the execution um, has been pretty remarkable. So my general view, to sum up, I think she is a you know a strong and secure but ineffective leader on domestic policy, um, uh, a strong and secure and pretty effective leader on foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. David? Oh, thank you, Kristen. <clears throat> and it's a pleasure to share the um, this session with Richard and Chris, uh, colleagues, uh, both of whom I have enormous respect for um, and have learned a lot from over the years. So um, my, my comments are going to try and follow the instructions that have been given us, even though this session, you know, this session is about elite politics, but the first point I'd, I think I'd like to make is that it's more important to look at the party as an institution than simply the leadership. 
Um, but since this is a session on the leadership, I want to be a good soldier and do what <laughs> was, was asked of us um, and make a number of observations. Um, the first one is that we, I think we have to be rather humble and admit that there is very much that we don't know about the leadership dynamics at any time in China. And particularly at this time, the, the box is more opaque and black than usual. Um, so Jungnan high watching uh, has always been more of an art than a science, but it's really, really difficult uh, these days in, in many ways to find uh, divisions, if you will, and proclivities. I mean, the one thing that's abundantly clear uh, is Xi Jinping. So my colleagues have already spoken to that. Um, and that's, let me, that's my second point. We do know that he has, he has centralized um, power in his own persona to an extent not seen since Deng, if not Mao. Um, but I'd make the distinction between centralization of power or personalization of power on one hand and consolidation of power on the other. Um, this may sound odd, but I don't think he has fully consolidated his own power yet over the bureaucracies. And let me elaborate why I think that is the case. He certainly personalized it in an extraordinary way. Um, you know, he's, he's demanded loyalty oaths. He's uh, demanded what the Chinese call biao tai, you know, to, to declare where you stand on a rather repetitive basis. He just did it with the media a couple weeks ago. He does it with the military, does it with every uh, bureaucracy that he meets with. And there have been uh, demands or, or there have been pledges in the uh, provincial media, at least, about Xi Jinping as the core of the party. So he's equating himself with the party. Last guy that did that was named Mao. Um, so uh, in some ways, you have to ask, if you need to demand loyalty oaths and biao ties and pledges, are you secure in your position? I would say huh, not really. That's, you know, to me, that shows an insecurity. But in the Chinese political system, everybody goes along when those pledges and biao ties are demanded, and they, um, they provide them. This is what the late and famous sinologist Lucian Pai used to refer to as feigned compliance, false compliance. Um, and there's a lot of theater, I think, always in Chinese politics, but uh, particularly at this time. So I don't think we should, as analysts, you know, look at these um, pledges and editorials and the ties and claim, oh yes, she's in control. Uh, it strikes me it's just the opposite. Um, well, not the opposite, he is in control. I do share Richard and Chris's views there. I don't think he's in danger, but I'm just trying to point out that um, there may not be as much strength in his uh, position as, as many analysts believe. We know that there's a lot of foot dragging in the economic bureaucracies. Chris spoke to that already. And there's a lot of discontent and opposition in the media to the crackdown on the media. We've seen evidence of that in recent weeks and even months. And in the educational system, um, with this campaign against Western hostile values, uh, Western textbooks, and so on. Uh, think so-called think tanks. I'm one of those people who think there is no such thing as a think tank in China. But uh, research institutions uh, in China are also unhappy with not being utilized under Xi Jinping. Uh, he has, you know, anecdotally, we, t we know all these people who work in these think tanks, and um, at least those that I meet with tell me that they aren't being asked or commissioned to write papers. Um, if they write them on their own volition, um, they're not sure if they're read and where they go in the system. And they're more, most importantly not sure what to write because the policy process has become highly politicized. <clears throat> and um, they're afraid to write about certain things and to offer views that may be at variance with Xi Jinping's. Um, so that, that, that in all three of these areas, economic bureaucracy, media, educational system, research institutes, the system has just frozen up uh, as a result of Xi's uh, personalization of power. And his, the anti-corruption campaign has further contributed to this freezing up. There's a pervasive sense of fear throughout the party, the government, the military, the educational system, and corporations <clears throat> uh, in society. Um, 
And so even if so, if the anti-corruption campaign is necessary, which it is, and I agree with my colleagues here, she had to clean house. It was quite far progressed. And, um, but it's all I'm pointing out is it's had collateral side of unintended side effects um, that are damaging the system. You know, corruption greases the system, makes the system work. What he's doing is making the system not work uh, in some ways. So that's the second point. Third point, um, our organizers posed the question for this session, are there certain bureaucracies that are benefiting or not at present? Well, answer yes. The coercive bureaucracies and the propaganda apparatus are definitely benefiting from uh, Xi's uh, repression. Um, there's big money in repression, ladies and gentlemen, in internal security, in intelligence work, in the propaganda system, in the military. So if you look at those, what I call the coercive apparatus on the one hand and the propaganda apparatus on the other hand, um, uh, and the military and the state-owned enterprises, these four together I call the iron quadrangle, they're all benefiting significantly from the policies under Xi. Uh, fourth point, there's no, there are no signs of open factionalism at the top, um, but the silence and lack of prominence of many leaders is very telling to me. Um, uh, fifth point I'll make is uh, gets to the personnel changes potentially at the fifth, at the sorry 19th Party Congress uh, next year that Chris has already mentioned. This could this is going to be very interesting to watch actually could make for a brokered convention with Chinese characteristics, you might say. <laughs> um, <laughs> we shall see. Um, and Chris is also right that the horse trading and the bargaining and the, the battles, really, um, this, this is what the Chinese system is all about, it's personnel. And battles take place before the event, so it's already starting. And how it proceeds between now and the autumn of 2017 is going to be very telling. Um, so four of the seven Politburo members um, must retire, and 13 of the 25 exist, sorry, four of the seven standing committee members and 13 of the 25 Politburo members must retire for age reasons, if indeed the age uh, norm is obeyed at the Congress. That will leave um, a number of vacancies to be filled. It will also leave a number of individuals in place. So we don't know who the vacancies to be filled will be, one assumes they will, they will be Xi Jinping men and women. Um, but we don't know a whole lot about who Xi Jinping's men and women are. This is a, another peculiarity. Here's a man who is, is at the top of the system, has risen through the system, but there is no identifiable clique or, or patron-client network, which is a better way to think about Chinese politics, that he has worked with and brought with him over time. Hu Jintao had that from the Youth League, Jiang Zemin had that from Shanghai. This guy does not have that, save a couple of individuals, Li Jian Shu and Ding Xue Xiang, I think his name is, and perhaps a few others. So um, the seven positions I think that are gonna have to be, um, or 12 positions that will have to be filled, it's gonna be interesting to see uh, who fills them. We don't know. Then there are those who remain, and those are potentially interesting cases. Li Keqiang, Wang Huning, Li Yuanqiao, Wang Yang, Liu Qibao, Sun Zhengsai, and Hu Junhua. So I won't take time to run through all of them, but <coughs> with one or, one or two of these individuals, Liu Qibao and Sun Zhengsai, are a little their disposition is unclear to me. If you look at their uh, records previously, uh, Leo in the propaganda system, Guangxi and Sichuan, um, Sun in uh, Jilin, and Chongqing where he is presently, their orientations are not terribly clear. They tend to look to be more authoritarian, hardline, if you will. Um, but the others, Li, Li Yanchao, Wang Yang, Hu Junhua, Li Keqiang, I would add in this group, and potentially Wang Huning, who's a real chameleon uh, and survivor, are what I would call reformists and soft authoritarians. So this sets up, in my mind, at the Congress, a kind of tripartite division, not a bifurcation, but a kind of trifurcation, if you will, um, between the three groups. Um, well, sorry, two groups and one man. Xi Jinping, whoever, who fill, those who fill the empty positions, and these potential reformers um, who have been sidelined under the last four years. 
So we'll have to watch this brokered convention of Chinese characteristics with great interest. Um, finally, leaders remain important in the Chinese system, and we have to pay attention to them. Um, but it's more important, I think, to pay attention to the institutions, uh, I've always felt, uh, if you're trying to analyze Chinese politics. So here's a couple of points to end on. First is, looking, going forward, watch the bureaucratic instruments of control and the millions of individuals who enforce repression and control in this system. Why? Because the experiences of other authoritarian states, both Leninist and non-Leninist authoritarian states, tells us that when the coercive apparatus and the propaganda apparatus become a little bit lax in their enforcement of repression, uh, then the system is coming down. It's really beginning to crumble. I would point to the East European cases in particular, and, uh, and encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to watch the film The Lives of Others, Das Leben den Anderen, uh, about the Stasi officer. It's a movie, yes, um, won the best documentary award at the Academy Awards, but it's very accurate about what happened inside the Stasi. Um, so the, the coercive apparatus, no matter how well you're funded, if you begin to sympathize with the objects of your repression, as was the case in, in East Germany, um, you don't do your job as efficiently as <laughs> you're supposed to. And then this Leninist edifice is really crumbling. So keep your eye on propaganda, internal security, state security. And so far, there are no signs of cracks. I'm not suggesting there are. <laughs> Quite to the contrary. But watch for that. Um, and as Chris, I think, noted, there are already there are the purges inside the Ministry of State Security and the counterintelligence apparatus and the military pretty significant. So you purge those apparatuses, what are you doing to them? Yes, you're cleaning them out, but you're also stressing the institutions. You're not producing loyalty necessarily from the institutions. Pushback. Look for pushback from key sectors, businessmen, media, intellectuals, and the military. Pushback can come in several forms, I think, three forms, passive resistance, active resistance, and abandonment of the system. Which reminds me that we should all reread Albert Hirschman's exit voice and loyalty. Because systems at this stage, uh, authoritarian Leninist systems in the, what many think the penultimate moribund stage, um, people in the system have three choices. You can, you can exit, leave, and what do we see? We see Chinese elites leaving the country and putting their money abroad in ever increasing numbers. $950 billion last year. Now we have the Panama Papers, <laughs> you know? People in the system are not confident about their system, and they are voting with their feet. So exit. Uh, Hirschman is right with China. Voice. <clears throat> well, you, voice means to push back openly, a active resistance. We don't see that um, because the hammer of the state will come down very hard. Uh, so we see what happens in all bureaucratic systems, authoritarian and otherwise, when you disagree with the policy of the top, passive resistance. People just don't implement policy. They just drag their feet, and that's a way of resisting. Um, it's hard to see, but that's what's been happening, I think, in the last three years in China and will continue to. So we have to, in closing, I think really, if you're going to look at uh, the future of the Chinese Communist Party, look at it in comparative terms uh, as a Leninist party state. It is very important to look at it that way, I think, not just as, a Ch as the Chinese Communist Party. Because Leninist party states are very predictable, what I call the Leninist life cycle, six or seven phases through which every one of them pass. And the Chinese Communist Party is in the last phase right now, uh, um, where they can either adapt and open the system and try and save themselves, which is what they were doing, I would argue, up to 2009, stopped doing, or they can crack down and think they can stay in power through sheer coercion. Brzezinski wrote very presciently about this uh, in his book, The Grand Failure. That's what China, China is in this stage. And Xi Jinping has selected the last option. Thinks the only way to save the party is through strengthening the party and suppressing you know, the, the society. Well, there's an alternative, uh, so-called soft authoritarianism versus hard authoritarianism. So we'll see if the Congress next year produces a shift. My own guess is not. And like Chris, I, or Richard, I can't remember, you know, there's this view that Xi Jinping is um, cracking down before he opens up, sweeping the house before you invite the guests in, as Mao, Mao used to put it. I don't buy it for a second. This guy is a hard authoritarian who sees, who's 
really drunk with his own power. And that's not good for the system. It's not good for China. What's it mean for foreign policy? I, I tend to agree with my colleagues. I don't think it affects foreign policy. Foreign policy is on kind of autopilot for China in a lot of ways. We're not going to see a big change in the South China Sea, U.S.-China relations, China-Japan, or anything else by you know, alteration of this collectivity of leaders at the top of their system. I think that's kind of an autonomous variable. So um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to use my position as moderator to raise three short questions for the panel, not addressed to any specific speaker. And then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, and I've been instructed we can, you know, well, we have at least 30 minutes. Um, depending on how many questions there are, we might be able to be a little flexible on that, too. Um, OK, so the first question I have is, why do you all think that uh, people outside of China are so quick to jump to these um, conclusions that uh, and make wild predictions about what's going on in China? Anything ranging from Xi Jinping will never step down to he will become assassinated, um, or, or even in the foreign policy realm that China is indeed a revision power and its foreign policy is unlike anything that we have ever seen before. I'm just wondering what you think the source of these type of kind of extreme views are uh, coming from outside of China. Um, another question I have is, <clears throat> do you think that the anti-corruption campaign has stalled very serious domestic reform, economic reform? Um, in other words, Xi Jinping didn't realize how long this campaign was going to take, and a lot of his political capital has been spent on the anti-corruption campaign as a result not having the resources to commit to serious domestic reform? Um, or is it, as uh, Professor Shambaugh has just suggested, that uh, lower level people are engaging in passive resistance and not implementing these reforms? Um, and then my final question is about um, lenses through which we can understand factional politics. Um, you know, many people, have, I think it's interesting the idea that Xi Jinping doesn't have a clear click, right? Um, a lot of people have interpreted the anti-corruption campaign as an attack against the Youth League faction, right? The populists who were in power uh, immediately prior to Xi Jinping's rule. And I'm wondering if this previous model of understanding factional politics as two main factions uh, kind of serving as um, a checks and balances against each other, the populists and the elitists. I'm, I'm thinking of ch the Chung Lee model of understanding factional politics as to whether or not this is still an accurate lens through which to interpret factional politics, um, whether or not the, the dominant factions are, are still equal, or if what we've seen is a real decline of the populists who, I'm not sure if they overlap with who, David, you're referring to as the, the soft authoritarians, but have these people really been um, kind of pushed out and seen a, a major reduction in their power. So you can take them in any order you would like. <laughs> you want to see chance? <clears throat> sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll run through them quickly. Uh, I mean, I think the, on the first question about where do we get these uh, wild assessments, I, I just find it striking, especially since Xi Jinping has come to power, how, how these issues that require, in my mind, a great deal of careful, subtle, and nuanced analysis, there seems to be a strong desire to jam these very complex issues into nice, neat, tight little boxes. So mm -hmm. Xi Jinping is a power-mad megalomaniac like Mao, or he wants to introduce right. the rule of law, or God knows what, when obviously the situation is much more complex. So I think that's one phenomenon that I don't understand. <laughs> Where it might be coming through is uh, opacity is frustrating, as we've all you know, sort of said in our, uh, in our uh, comments. And I'm really struck by the fact that, it, just in my own experience, uh, the number of people who actually know what's going on inside the system is an incredibly small number now mm -hmm. under Xi Jinping and getting smaller all the time. And, and as David suggested in his comments, that, that's probably not a, <laughs> a good trend for a dynamic society, you know, et, et cetera. Um, but, uh, and that makes it much more difficult. And I think that a lot of resources, sources, whatever you want to say, that people have relied upon over the years to get insight on the system, those people are not as willing to talk as they used to be, or they just don't know. They've been cut out, and they're frustrated. And so my own view is that they tend to then uh, complain <laughs> and project a more negative, uh, perhaps, uh, assessment or picture of what's happening than what might actually be happening, because they were influential, and now they're not. And they don't like that, uh, just like all of us wouldn't. Um, you know, the other third piece is I think that there was a trend in the in the high politics watching community of 
assessing during the mid to late Hu Jintao era that the party was on some inevitable or inexorable path toward greater institutionalization. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my own sense, Hu Jintao was really, or seems to have been, the uh, the exception rather than the rule. And you know, mm -hmm. Xi Jinping is very much an inconvenient truth for the school that believed they were headed in a more institutionalized direction. Um, and so I think when you're confronted with the facts changing, you have a choice to make. You either admit that there's something going on with the model and you shift your model appropriately, or you do the intellectual gymnastics to jam the facts to fit your model. You know, and and so. I just see time and again that it strikes me that this is why small, seemingly small evidence, from my point of view, is amplified into serious signs of discord you know, within the leadership. I also think that we do have to draw this line between whether or not we like what Xi Jinping is doing with the system and how we let that influence our, our uh, assessment of what's actually going on in terms of his strength, position, the survivability of the system, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, on the anti-corruption campaign, uh, campaign, no doubt in my mind that it's, uh, that it's having an impact on reform. I, I, I'm not sure I would necessarily link it so much to reform. It's certainly having an, an impact on growth, you know, no, mm -hmm. no question there. Um, I often think some of these anecdotes about how the, the provincial party chiefs are so deathly afraid they won't sign off on any deals, that's not the sense I get from businesses who seem to be doing just fine with <laughs> getting deals executed. It has gummed up the system. There's, there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. What's striking is that it's abundantly clear that Xi Jinping knows that it's having that effect, shaving off whatever you want to say, 0.5, maybe even 1% of GDP, and he doesn't seem to be bothered by that, you know, which says something about his mentality and, and what he thinks are, are the important factors. Um, and then to the third, I, I always thought that sort of by, by the split thing was way too simplistic. Um, you know, uh, to, I'm not sure there ever was a Princelings versus uh, Youth League grouping or faction. Mm -hmm. And my own sense is that the situation is far more complex now um, and will continue to be so. Um, so, you know, reductionism on this target is, is bad. That's my, <laughs> that's my sort of general sense. Um, well, I mean, the... Uh, I frankly don't think there's been that much discord or sensationalist reporting about Xi Jinping himself. Obviously, there's pressure, particularly on journalists there, you know, deadlines being, you know, want, wanting the kudos of being the first to call something or this, that and the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and the opacity that Chris talks about is really real, you know, having worked there as a journalist for over a decade. Uh, you can't just go and see somebody and shoot the breeze about what's happening in the Politburo. Yeah. You know, having covered U.S. politics for four years, the U.S. is totally overreported, uh, and and China China is totally underreported. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, generally, I think people have seen you know the the view that Chris has put about Xi Jinping. I think is the general mainstream view of him, mm -hmm. and obviously that's dressed up now and again. I mean, I don't think the comparison with Mao is terrific. I mean, the, the, I mean, I mentioned Mao, but in the terms of the cult of personality, I think that's over, overwrought. But as a different type, an unexpectedly tough, assertive leader, leading an unprecedented uh, anti-corruption campaign, smashing all the institutional furniture and rules, I think it's accurate. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's wrong. I think the area that is most difficult and there's most uh, disagreement about in China now is the Chinese economy. Uh, mm -hmm. is it, does it really have the ability to change? Uh, have they got an entirely new model? Uh, can it work in tandem with uh, an enduring Leninist political system? Mm -hmm. I think that's the area which is most difficult to read, and I think that's where you, act, frankly, have the most extreme views. Mm -hmm. uh, is because you know it's a bit of a blank slate. Of, you know, with the Chinese economy, you can get any set of figures you like to get any sort of mm -hmm. uh, you know end results you like, and I think that is the that is the area where the jury is really out, not on Xi Jinping. Um, Anti-corruption, I think it, you know, it's possible it might have slowed things down a little bit. I'm not so sure. Certainly when I was living in China, it was, was always the, you know, corruption greased the wheels. It was a sort of, it wasn't like Indonesia under Suharto where it brought the whole system, you know, tumbling down. It was a way to get things done mm -hmm. within networks and the like and make sure everybody got a cut and the like. Obviously, Xi Jinping and, and Wang Qishan have a very different view of that. Um, I don't know. I mean, we, you know, we've gone through cycles on the anti-corruption campaign. Every, every six months, everybody says, oh, it can't go any further. Um, and it uh, does. Um, uh, I don't know whether it will slow down in the sort of, um, you know, the jousting um, in the, uh, before the party congress next year. 
but the I, I think it's all already been incredible. And I think one thing about the anti-corruption campaign, these campaigns in China leave scars for years. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we don't really have a sense because we know so little about China about how deep those scars are. Um, the, on the issue of, I don't know whether or not that's it's Chung Li's views, but I certainly thought it was always really t a waste of time to think about Chinese politics in a binary factional sense. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly under Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, there was a lot more cooperation at the top than sort of day-to-day -day sort of fighting. Um, uh, things are much more fluid. There's multiple networks besides the uh, China Youth League and the Shanghai Gang. You know, you go into each Chinese prov uh, province, particularly mm -hmm. Guangzhou, each Chinese city. So it was never a kind of zero-sum game between those two, even though it might have worked out a little bit like that at the top. Yeah. Um, so in that respect, I think Xi Jinping maybe has been a breath of fresh air because he's released us mm -hmm. from just that sort of cookie-cutter model. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'll agree with my colleagues on, the, on your first question, Kristen. And, and with Richard, I don't think there's been a lot of wild speculation out there, um, some. Um, but speculation occurs when there's a, a lack of information, an opacity. So mm -hmm. it, if to the extent there is any, it's a direct correlation to the kind of system we're trying to understand. Um, uh, how valuable, if I understood your second question, it, how valuable is factional analysis to understanding Chinese politics, if I could maybe rephrase it a little? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's been terribly valuable for a very long time. And as Richard, I don't even think the, the Youth League, Shanghai faction, princeling, you know, these kinds of groupings are, um, are definitive. You know, they do exist. Um, but coalition politics uh, exist in Chinese politics, too. And coalitions shift and change by the issue and over mm -hmm. time. So if you're you know, a youth league person, you may find yourself in bed with a Shanghai gang person on one issue and a Shanghai gang people with princelings on another issue. So it's a, there's a fluidity um, to this, and, but it's a black box. We don't know exactly how these coalitions shift at the top of the system. Um, but I don't think factional analysis in the way we used to use it during the Mao, Mao and even the Deng periods is, has been terribly useful for some time in, in the Jiang Zemin and after periods. Mm -hmm. Rather, three... There are, th I have always thought, three better ways to study Chinese politics. One, bureaucratic systems, shitong. Two, mm -hmm. patron-client networks. Um, and three, localities and provinces, geographic uh, distinctions. That's certainly true in some uh, systems, like the military, more than other systems. You know, you come from Shandong, <laughs> that has, or, mm -hmm. or Hunan. There are certain perspectives and, and networks that go way, way back, generations. Your third question about, if I heard you correctly, you ended saying, are the soft authoritarians, have they really been pushed out? Mm -hmm. um, no, absolutely not. They're everywhere throughout the system. Um, and uh, they're just lying low under the current circumstances. They have no choice except, it goes back to Hirschman, exit voice and loyalty, mm -hmm. to leave. And um, we're seeing some of that, but uh, they are feigning compliance to to the extent they have to. Uh, they haven't changed their views on, on how wrong the direction of China is that Xi Jinping is taking it and their preferences. Believe me, and they have a whole agenda. If they were tomorrow put into power, boom, they could go, go, back, go back to. If you look at the communiques of the fourth plenum of the, both the 16th and the 17th party congresses, these two communiques are blueprints for soft authoritarian reform. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they would, first of all, be doing something new. They, they would be going back to the period, I think, that existed from 98 to 08. And they have central committee documents to say, look, comrades, this is what we agreed and have abandoned. <laughs> but they could say, you know, we have this document, nice blueprints, just the same way Deng Xiaoping went back to the reform program of the early 1960s when he came to power in 78. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the soft authoritarians are very much in the system. Um, the question is, uh, you know, how do <laughs> how do they assert themselves, reassert themselves? Um, so, leaving scars for years. I was, I noted Richard's point about the anti-corruption campaign. This is an important point. Um, I really think the anti-corruption campaign has really, I don't know, broken is too strong a word, but it has really damaged the system. 
Yes, it's helping the system in one way, but it's doing at least as much damage. And we don't know, you know, the scars from the Cultural Revolution lasted for a generation or more. Mm -hmm. These people say, say the corruption campaign ends tomorrow, these people still have to sit next to each other in the office, live in the same neighborhood, and coexist in the same sphere, you know, despite what happened during the campaign. Uh, so this is a, you know, read the book, The Wounded, about the Cultural Revolution. This is a very, very wounded society. And when we come out of the anti-corruption campaign, whenever that is, the wounds are going to be very, very deep. Okay, thank you very much. We have um, time now for audience um, questions. I believe there are microphones in both aisles, so please feel free to walk over to those or, or just raise your hand. Yep. In the front row, yeah. Scott Harold from Rand. Uh, Chris, Richard, David, uh, having learned f so much from you all over the years, I'm very pleased to have your views today and, and to pose this question to you. You talked about the future and the unknowability of uh, a lot of what's happening, but uh, is it your assessment looking out to 2022 that uh, with what Xi Jinping has done, with the riskiness now of being an ex-Chinese leader, or at least for your faction, or your clique, or your patron-client network, whatever you want to call it, is there, has he, what, have his actions increased the risk to him himself, were he to step down in 2022, as we have often thought in the past, well, you only ever serve two five-year terms. So in 2022, you could imagine Xi Jinping might think, boy, I've, I've got to do what Yeltsin did and find a Putin, find somebody who's going to let me step down and not suffer the consequences? Or would you say he has upped the incentives for himself to stay on? And just a point of clarification, David, you talked about this massive wounds that are coming from this campaign, characterizing it as something somehow akin to the Cultural Revolution. Uh, I don't go to China anywhere near as often as you do, but and I know that people are some scared in various places, but is the is that a really accurate comparison? Because I, I had the impression that the people who are scared are those really truly corrupt people who've led various bureaucracies or ministries or companies, but that the average person is not suffering and is not going to go back and have to live next door to someone. And so the people who might d be damaged by this are people who are probably going to be dead by the time the campaign's over because they'll have been put in prison or they'll have really suffered. But could you just elaborate on that? Thank you. Well, fair, fair enough. Uh, question, Scott. The last one, it's not like the Cultural Revolution where the entire urban society was caught up in this campaign. Um, but uh, it is across Xitongs, you know, it's across parties, government, military, and the corporate Xito, urban corporate Xitong. So, um, you know, that, those scars are, are taking place on a daily basis, and the fear factor I talked about is uh, one of those scars. You know, people are afraid of turning, they're being called on now to report on each other, to turn people in. Uh, I've heard anecdotal stories of academic colleagues who've been called in for questioning. Oh, I understand you went to a conference in such and such a place, and you made such and such a comment. Did you really make that comment? This is what I meant by it. This is... Um, this kind of interrogative uh, dimension of this uh, campaign, plus the arbitrariness of the campaign. Look, every, not everybody, most people in this system are corrupt, okay? I will make that statement. Uh, so the question, therefore, is how do you enforce the campaign? Answer selectively. And that is, you know, that gets into the whole question of political agendas. And um, so that's what I meant by uh, scars. So, and then on your, your, um, your first question, um, I forgot now, I had something to say on it. 2022. Oh, tw yeah, well, Xi Jinping, you know, he may want to stay on uh, that long. First of all, I'm not certain he's going to make it that long, okay? I'll be that bold enough to say, I think there is so much discontent with him in that system, some of which we've been seeing through these letters, and if they're real or not, we can debate that. I think he is really not very popular in the system. He may be popular with the public, he is not popular in the system and with the elites. So. We should not assume he's going to make it. Yes, I suspect he probably is all the way to the end of his term, but Jiang Zemin tried to stay on too, and there was a, and he tried to recreate the position of Zhu Xi, chairman. They didn't, the system didn't allow that. I don't think the system, and the people who are discontent with Xi, would want to endorse a prolongation of his tenure in office. Uh, so that's a long way away. 
But I have a very different take, I think. Maybe Chris and I should debate this. I don't see she as all that strong in the system. I think there's a false veneer. The Chinese call Wai Ying, Nei Run. Hard on the outside, soft on the inside. We, as analysts, should not fall analytically for the false veneer. Um, obviously, it's unknowable about 2022. I don't know, maybe by that stage, there'll be a you know, Shangri-La hotel on the Paracel Islands and he can retire to the penthouse suite <laughs> there. Um, uh, uh, but the, um, you know, I think if, if we, you know, Chinese institutional practices are evolving. Um, uh, I think people think they've evolved, but they're evolving. But if they go backwards and we don't get a clear successor uh, nominated next year, then I guess some people within the system, as David suggests, will think kind of all bets are off. Um, certainly when Jiang Zemin stayed on after in 2002, um, people were bitterly angry at him for that. Um, people are still bitterly angry at Jiang Zemin these days, uh, who's still with us. Um, so I think if, if Xi Jinping, that's a very obvious thing to do. I think then there, there could be, I think that would be uh, portend a much bigger internal fight. Okay, good morning, panelists. My name is Cody Eckert, formerly of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. I have two questions for you. First, uh, to botch a Chinese idiom, I often liken the Chinese leadership, uh, leadership to a swan peaceful and serene above water with flappers flipping crazily underneath the surp surface. How accurate do you think this is? Um, the Chinese leadership is notorious for having contingency plans. For contingency plans, what are their, do you feel are their blind spots, uh, institutional or otherwise? What do they not know that they don't know? And second of all, uh, Professor Shambaugh, you talking about your uh, contested convention with Chinese characteristics, love it. Uh, I was wondering, I was thinking, can we liken Xi Jinping to a Donald Trump figure? Uh, fomenting, nas fomenting national fervor, strong man, they already have the wall. Uh, <laughs> I was just, and is this part of a global right wing upswelling? Thank you. <laughs> no, I wouldn't compare Xi Jinping to Donald Trump. Um, but I like your metaphor about the swan, uh, you know, but even on the surface, I'm not sure things are all that stable. Under the surface, I would agree. It's a good metaphor at any time for, under, for looking at China. They, you know, they spend a lot of effort, this system, to create a false veneer of stability to the outside, well, mostly to their own people, right? And then secondly, the outside world. Underneath, and a lot of this, uh, you know, feigned compliance is very false in my view. And uh, that was the case in other authoritarian systems and boom, they came down overnight. And, we, and then the post-mortems are, oh gosh, we missed that signal and that signal, and oh, it was really unstable there. We should have seen that. Well, I think there's some, you know, some of that in China, some of that in China today. Go ahead. <laughs> well, well, I, I don't, um, I might say I would never compare China to a swan. It never <laughs> looks calm to me. But uh, what don't they know? I tend to think entire, internally in China, they're extremely well-informed. Um, um, all the sorts of problems that we pick out, I think they know about them. Um, I never felt like I was telling anybody in Chinese officialdom anything they didn't know. Um, uh, what don't they know? What is their blind spot? I guess their blind spot is uh, their adamant belief or conviction that the current system is fit to last um, uh, and can produce um, the kind of economic growth uh, the system demands. I might say that level of growth is much lower. Um, um, you know, China doesn't have the same pressure and will have much less pressure, pressure in coming years to create jobs. There's simply not the new number of people coming along who, who need jobs. Uh, so some of the pressure is off in that respect. But I think in the, the, the blind spot is the, you know, the ability to openly examine and contest the core assumptions of the party system. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would just elaborate slightly by saying I think uh, if they are underestimated, it's the issue of time, that they think they have more time perhaps on some of these issues, especially reform, than they do. Uh, you know, I, I find it interesting that just in the short period between the third plenum where all of these you know, suggestions were unveiled till now, uh, definitely a sense 
that the urgency, if you will, has declined and that the muddling through strategy perhaps uh, can continue on, not indefinitely, but longer uh, than I think their assessment was two or three years ago. Um, certainly through the party congress, which makes some sense. My own view is that they can do so, uh, at least through that time frame. But the issue is how much confidence do you have that, you know, let's, let's concede to Xi Jinping and his colleagues that indeed they are correct, that the current system can kind of stumble or bumble its way through, at least through next fall, which I think is an easy concession to make. And let's concede as well, say that Xi Jinping somehow runs the table uh, politically at the party congress. How much confidence do you have that he will then turn the dial up, if you will, on those more economic liberalization reforms? My own assessment is I'm much less confident than I was three years ago that he'll do that. Additional questions? Danny, and then in the back. Hi, uh, Danny Nadal, Georgetown University. I just wanted to, to uh, bring up one of the, the, the cleavages that you mentioned but didn't really uh, go into depth with, on uh, about the regional, um, the regional provincial um, cleavages in Chinese domestic politics as one potential avenue for, uh, for looking at, at, at Chinese politics uh, instead of the, the, the binary factional politics model. Uh, w what do you think are the, the, the regional geographic uh, dimensions of, of the current, um, you know, of, of Xi Jinping's power, where does he draw power from? Uh, who is he going against? Because in the Hu Jintao era, era, we heard a lot about you know devolving more power to the western regions and to the poorer mm -hmm. regions and to the rural areas. Um, so what's going on now? What 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 does geographic politics look like in China today? I'll kick off. I, I just I find it interesting that in the last four years, uh, being a provincial party secretary has gone from the best job in China to arguably the worst, you know, over the course of those four years in that. In the previous period, you had power, lots of access to graft, uh, a fair amount of autonomy, a solid uh, sense that, you know, that social compact that they've had for 30 years, which is you accept your horrible official salary, but you have all these other opportunities, was there, therefore, binding you more uh, tightly to the system because there was opportunity, you know, to, to move up. That's all been taken away. I mean, if you look at the provinces, they're being told, um, we will reduce your types of revenue, land grabs, uh, local government financing vehicles, all of these sort of lovely black piggy banks that they had for years and years, all gone. And there's not yet a sense, we'll see. I mean, a, a key thing to watch here is they're supposed to deliver on a fiscal reform plan this year, um, which is supposed to uh, take a, a real effort at rebalancing transfer payments from the center to the provinces. Since that sort of 2012-13 period, all they've been doing is taking away revenue streams from the localities without providing those. And so when they, like I found it very interesting last fall when they did their kind of standard audit of local government finances, I think everyone in Beijing expected it would show the localities were cash poor. What it showed was that they were cash rich, um, which was a great frustration, you know, for the, uh, for the central government. And I think the reason why is that, and it was interesting in my assessment, the different ways different elites in Beijing interpreted that data. You know, some of them thought, well, I guess we better get busy on that fiscal reform plan to reassure these guys and, and let them know it's going to be okay. Others, Xi Jinping, I think, included it said, oh, it's passive resistance, they're trying to stop me, they're trying to stop my agenda. Swivel that anti-corruption turret toward the provinces more directly, right? Two very different assessments of how to think about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd go look at the, the wonderfully named vertical fiscal imbalance and the like. I'm, I certainly never, never got on top of that when I lived in China, but I think it's an area that really needs a lot more study and about the tax base and how it works. I mean, we had a big change in the early 90s when, the, when it was re-centralised but then that system, I think, is coming under a lot of strain. Um, uh, the second point, I guess, and I don't have a grand sort of architecture of regional differences, but um, one of the striking things of the current economic slowdown has been what's happened in the northeast. Um, uh, these, these areas have really have been negative growth uh, for a long part of last year. There's no obvious and easy way back. Um, uh, maybe that's one reason why China's being nice to the Japanese, because that had been a traditional investment area. Mm -hmm. But I, um, but I, so I mean, you know, you don't have to. You, look, you only have to look at the United States. The United States can be strong if uh, West Virginia will never be as rich as Manhattan, right? So you can have these differences. Um, but I, I really feel that there's large parts of China now that are really being left behind, without any obvious uh, way to see that writing itself in any even symbolic fashion. I agree. Okay, I, 
I uh, know in the in the back corner. Oh, I apologize. I had. Um, <laughs> we can come back to you in just a second. Uh, David Sedney, formerly with the uh, Defense and State Departments, and, and now associated with CSIS. And I, perhaps what Chris will see is a, a continuation of the false search for simplicity in analysis. Um, and when you analyze elite politics in China, uh, is this more uh, a uh, West Wing, to use a popular culture reference, a West Wing kind of approach where it's politics and issues uh, conducted within a framework, or is it more a house of cards approach uh, where uh, violence, personality, uh, and uh, unconstrained uh, use of every lever? Uh, I, hark back to Scott Harold's uh, presentation where he had a paragraph up on his slide uh, that said there were reports of many assassination, rumors of reports of many assassination attempts against Xi Jinping. Mm. Uh, maybe these are the kind of speculations that Kristen was talking about. But if you have that to, to divide between a more West Wing approach or a more house cards analysis of the elite politics, where would you go? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm sure I like either of those, but uh, I, I, yeah, I, I guess I would say the following. I, I think what's striking about Xi Jinping, and I think it does speak to both Richard and David's points about the scars of the Cultural Revolution, and it's not unique to Xi Jinping. I think it's true of all of his colleagues, all of them for whom that, uh, that was a formative experience. I mean, what I find striking in his biography, and I never went to delve deeply into pop psychology analysis, but my sense is that, you know, what an interesting contrast in experiences, the headiness of the revolutionary period and moving into Zhongnanhai as a former peasant, you know, and all that, and your father running up the flagpole and so on, and then the Cultural Revolution and being sent down yourself to be a pig farmer, watching your father get purged and so on. The sense that I get is that he developed from those experiences. This is a very Hobbesian system <laughs> with very few rules, and if I'm going to play in that system, I'm going to win. And I'm going to fight in a very brass knuckles uh, approach. So I guess if I had to choose between the false dichotomy you've set up, I would uh, <laughs> choose the House of Cards model. I didn't see uh, Scott's presentation. I came a little bit late, but I might say in the 90s, there used to be lots of rumors about assassination attempts against Jurongji yeah. mm. um, when he was sort of going around and busting up various cartels. So maybe there's a bit more of a continuum in that respect. <laughs> well, I, I too think that the House of Cards um, uh, metaphor is, is more appropriate to the present time, and that's part of the problem. It's moved from a West Wing model that Dung started, consensual, collective, uh, informed decision-making, to much more of a personalized House of Cards, tiger eat tiger, um, you know, keep the keep your enemies off balance. These are classic Maoist tactics, by the way. Um, loyalty oaths, right? That's a classic Maoist tactic. Um, so I think you know, like, uh, David, your your second model I think is more accurate uh, for the present time. Assassination rumors, I've heard them too. Um, one never knows what to make of them, uh, but. You can tell that Xi Jinping has changed his personal bodyguard unit two or three times in the last uh, 18 months, right? Or two years. Not that I'm aware. We, we do know that. So maybe that's normal rotation. Maybe that's not normal rotation. <laughs> not sure. Um, but this is a system, you know, let's remember where, uh, where, where power, you know, becomes very, uh, very personal and physical the physical well-being of leaders uh, is a factor, right? Even if you look at this letter that, you know, of dissent that was published on the internet, there is an interesting sentence or two in there that, Mr. Xi, you should resign, or your physical well-being and those of your family members uh, may, may cause some difficulty. That's sort of, who knows? But uh, we don't know. But uh, it's, you know, this is a very, very uncertain time at the top of the system. It kind of reminds, it does have correlations to the Maoist era in elite politics uh, to me, not so much Cultural Revolution mass politics. Um, but remember, Mao was not popular with the bureaucrats, so what did he do? Leapfrog uh, approach, go to the masses, get the masses support, the populist, you know. What's Xi Jinping doing? Leapfrog, populist support, and who does not support Xi? At least some of the elites. He's, I think a larger percentage than uh, we know. So there are a lot of parallels there, I think. 
And if he keeps going the way he's going, he's just breaking his own system, in my view, the same way Mao broke his own system. Um, it is already 12.30 and at least one of our panelists has to go, but since I did steal the opportunity for this gentleman down here to ask a question, I will give you the last question, so I hope you make it a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Ben, I'm with the Eurasia Group. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any speculation as to the ma makeup of the Politburo Standing Committee in 2017. So, were you here for our presentation? Yeah, but you know, specific people or whether they like to go back to nine, whether some people will stay or leave. Oh, I have no insight into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, presumably, if they, the model they should follow is those that are already on the Politburo will move into the standing committee. So that we know what the so-called selectorate is already. Um, you know, so that would include potentially uh, Wang Yang, Hu Junhua, Sun Zheng Sai, Liu Qi Bao, Li Yuan Chao, and Wang Hu Ning. Um, and the two other names I mentioned, Li Jian Xu and Ding Xue Xiang. Uh, those are Xi acolytes who may, you know, leapfrog all the way to the standing committee. Um, so th that's the pool from which uh, the standing committee will be chosen. I would be surprised if somebody helicoptered, you know, from outside that pool all the way onto the standing committee, they make it onto the Politburo. But this is still a very progressive kind of promotion system, mm -hmm. right? So we know pretty much of, of those seven um, or eight, uh, some of them will move up into the vacated uh, four slots, okay? There are gonna be four slots, so eight will have to compete for mm -hmm. four. All right, I, I, I truly apologize. We don't have time for more questions. Um, but thank you very much for attending this session. And thank you to our speakers. Let's give them a round of applause.